It's just not fast enough. What are you gonna do, like add a cam? <laughs> no, like a 98 Pro Charger or, you know, all motor, just huge. Yeah, yeah do that. All right, yeah, I'm down with that. Go big, but how big? How many cubes? You know, S&S has got that 124 crate motor. Yeah. It, the price is it's not even that bad. I wonder what the max they can build that 88 to. Uh, I don't know. I don't have the answer. I don't know how big you can make these twin cam blocks before there's nothing left. But I know the one guy who has the answer. Panhead Andy. Now at this time, I know I gotta talk to Panhead. Gotta get his opinion. They call me Panhead Andy, and I've been in the automotive mechanical business in one way, shape, or form for 40 some odd years, since 1975. Go down to Prestige, start talking to Panhead and Bill Westrick, the owner. Hey, I'm Bill Westrick from Prestige Custom Cycles in Elmsford, New York. We uh, service Harley Davidsons, full engine builds, we do some restoration. Uh, we work on everything back to knucklehead era all the way up to present. I started popping off about crate motors and everything. And so we started talking about a crate motor. You know, but I, I know what Pan is going to say. He's, he's going to be, no crate. no crate, build it up. And he immediately says, he's like, yo, you want to do it, do it right. Build it up from scratch. You can put anything you want inside of it. I love it when a customer wants to go completely berserk and just build a monster. How big can you go? And then Bill says, you can do a 131. What about the 143 L Monstro? There's something, first of all, nobody's Op got it. Optimo, Ultima. Oh, Ultima? No. It's made in like Korea. I'm wondering if by doing a 131, you're removing too much material. Is there? too little material left to hold it reliably. He's like, it's plenty of material if it's installed correctly. Okay. So we do a lot of engine builds at Prestige, um, but we get a customer once or twice a year, um, like John, that just wants the best of the best. Because I'm telling him I'm making a video on this motor, I'm gonna beat this shit out of this engine, and I need it to be reliable. He's like, yes, go for it, please. Beat the shit out of it. Green light. Green light. It took a couple of months to nail down all the components that were gonna go into this build. All right, so the day finally comes, go down to Prestige, me, Bill and Panhead are going over the finalized list, parts that I've come up with through my couple months of research. He had his ideas of how he wanted to build this motor, and for the most part, they were on par with the way we do things here. He was adamant about keeping the dual exhaust with the straight pipes. I'm sick and tired of all these M8s just making crazy power way too easy. Like, fuck them. Okay, oh, my bike made 140 horsepower. All I did was a cam. Like, oh, and a two into one. How about I make damn near 140 horsepower without going two into one? Do it the hard way. Probably sound way better. Sound way better. Um, I mean, it's a twin cam, so you get the twin cam respect for making the same power. Starting with an 88 cubic inch. Um, so we had a lot of backs and forths with uh, myself, uh, Andy, uh, our technician, Panhead. Now, mid November comes, 2022. Finish the previous video that I did on this bike. It goes live. One week later, I bring the bike in and we rip the engine out. What happened with this primary shoe? 
too much fun or at some point in time somebody had the, the chain set too high so it kept too much tension. Now here's how it works with these early twin cam cases. If you want anything bigger than 100 cubic inches, then you're going to need to send your case out to be bored out to accept larger cylinders. So the 88 cubic inch Harley motor has a 3.75 inch bore and a 4 inch stroke. The 131 that we're building is going to have a 4 and a quarter inch bore and 4 and 5 eighths inch stroke. Which means we're going to need another crank. So we decided to get the SNS crank. And then on top of that, the heads need to be sent out to be machined and reworked to whichever cams you're getting and however your build is going. Now that's it. The parts are sent out to Revolution Performance. That's expected to be six or seven weeks. And I'm thinking, I need to get this chassis out of Prestige. And Bill, the owner of Prestige, was nice enough to trailer it over to Sam's house, which is a mile away. And that's where it sat. Yo, smell that. That's the hizzle for shizzle. This it's a lot of work. All this shit in the back requires like mad tweaking to make it straight, you know? Believe me, that's gonna be my entire life for the next month. Is, you know, I'm not thinking just horsepower. Now I'm thinking, all right, I can shed weight while I'm at it. So I'm trying to eliminate things. I'm trying to make things, I'm changing things out for lighter parts. How much work is it though? Like quite a bit. Like front end's gonna have to come off again. Really? Yeah, I Why? gotta, I gotta oh, put the upper sliders the back. back on. Yep. Yeah, they came out sick. Good. You know, he's not right around the corner. He's, he's 20 minutes away. All right. Sandpaper? Do you, yeah, do you have sandpaper? I don't know. You know what? I might have something. Not everything works out. You got to be prepared. When you're bike building, you're going to get a lot of things that go wrong. Is this like, are we doing some Jesse James type shit right here? Basically. Shit doesn't fit. Bolts strip. Things like, these are real problems that really happen. And when you're not in your own garage, it only makes it more difficult. Now Sam is a pro mechanic, but he keeps all his pro tools at his shop, not in his garage. The clock is ticking. There is a finite date that this bike has to be done. There's, there's another wrench into the mix. It's not just the engine we're doing. The bike needs to be painted as well. And this is the time that the parts are gonna be brought to the painter. I'm waiting on some body pieces. They finally do come in right after the first of the year. Stock bolts are 27 grams and these are 16 grams. Sick, 11 grams. 11 grams per. It was a difficult time in my life. I have a young infant and wife at home, and I have a job that I have to be at, and trying to find time to balance everything while still getting work done on this bike. All I know is that it's going to be a busy winter. Yeah. I can only imagine what problems are ahead. I mean, when you... <laughs> that, that's like, it's big boy problems at that point. Yeah. Finally, mid 
mid-January, some good news. Bill, the owner of Prestige, calls me up. Parts have arrived. When can you get the chassis back here? I said, give me two days, I'll have it there before you guys even open it. He's a great. I'll have Andy ready to go. He'll work on it as long as the bike's here. So I thought I could get the bike back to Prestige on my own. I didn't want to inconvenience anybody with trailering. It's a real pain in the ass. Besides, Sam lives on a giant hill. So I could actually just roll it out of his house down this huge hill, and I'm already halfway to Prestige anyway. But I don't want to do it in broad daylight and look like a freaking idiot pushing some rolling chassis in January. Now, <laughs> bully me. Shit gets crazy from here. Five in the morning, pushing this motherfucker for a mile. All right, I finally did it. And the rear tire is dragging. But I made the man a promise that that bike would be there before they opened that morning and the bike was there. And then when Panhead arrived for work, Panhead started to put together what he would later describe as the angriest motor he's ever built. Ever built. Ever. It's built to order, not mass produced and put on a shelf. Swap these out for the ARP. It's a nice, nice flywheel set. So Prestige, they take these parts, they send it out to Revolution Performance, who's also supplying the cylinders and pistons in this case. And then Rev Performance takes those parts, they bore out the case, they machine the heads, and then they take the SNS crank, which is already a hundred percent stronger than a stock crank, and they give it the bulletproofing job, which is truing, welding, balancing, plugging, and make it literally unbreakable. unbreakable. Now these are forged flat top pistons by Revolution Performance. They do have negative 3.6 cc valve reliefs built in. And with this combined with the cams and the head work, the final compression ratio comes out to 11.4 to one. You know, I gotta say the overall engine actually got pieced together pretty quickly. There's not even that many parts. It's just a whole lot of know-how and a bunch of specialty tools that go into it. You know, before you know it, you're looking at an engine. It's not just pieces anymore. Now, as far as the heads, everybody's got their different stages for different Harley performance levels, but Revolution Performance gave this their stage three head work. You know what? I got another thing for the, the Dyna Bros out there. I think you can take this. Meet me at Hayes in Le Mans. Turns out he blew his motor that day. And guess whose motor is still rolling? Your boy. Porting. Two inch intake valves. 1.630 exhaust valves. 0.675 dual lift springs going to be a monster. I don't call it the 131R for no reason. It is a race motor. 
End of story. So now it's time to work on the cam chest, which is one of the more intricate parts of the entire engine. Uh, the parts include the T-Man 662-2 PS2 cams, which are gear driven. All right, so when you want to step up and go full race 131, come see me. I have to admit, I was a little skeptical when John insisted on using T-Man 662 cams. That's because they have a really aggressive valve opening and closing ramp system. But I was confident that between Revolution Performance doing the heads, that we could build a valve train that could handle all that abuse. Although somebody told me that they're technically a touring cam, uh, I don't see anything touring about it. When I think touring, I'm thinking boring, lazy, old man, low end torque, anything but. Big old cams that make big old power. I did want to go gear drive because it's more accurate, it's more consistent, especially with these old, you know, twin cams. They have antiquated ECUs and no oxygen sensors, so you get a little bit more power. But Andy loves to use fueling cams. Talking about this build with John, I recommended the fueling cams because they're excellent grinds, they make good power, and they're easy on the valve train. I got nothing against fueling cams. I got them in my soft tail and they're nasty. But fueling cams are known to be gentle on valve trains. And to me, gentle means compromise. And compromise means loss of power. So the list of parts that he wanted was very extensive and a lot of the parts were there to uh, prevent power loss to the valve and drive trains. Even if it's rough on a valve train, you just build the valve train up to be able to handle that. So we were attempting to bridge the power gap between the true dual straight pipe and a two into one exhaust system. Now can you get more horsepower? Of course, two into one exhaust, but they're ugly and they sound like shit. I don't want any loss of power. I want to go all out and minimizing the power loss to the rear wheel. So the cams are now driving the fueling race lifters. All right, Andy, what do you got going on here? We're applying a vacuum to this tool here to, as you can see, pull all the air out of the lifters and replace it with the oil that's supposed to be in there. Just makes things a little easier on startup. Also inside the cam chest is the fueling race series cam plate and oil pump, and everything is held down with ARP bolts. John was as hands-on as much as he could be with this build within reason. Having his hands in there to help me, you know, do this, that, and the other thing was actually good for the project, good for his knowledge. Got to show me what kind of skills he really has. Next is the fueling race adjustable push rods, and then the SNS shot peened forged roller rockers, considered to be the best in the industry. So, if you think you're going to run high lift cams and much stiffer valve springs without upgrading your rocker support, then you're going to end up finding out that. <laughs> there's going to be a whole lot of flex in there. You're going to ultimately lose power and probably eventually down the road have catastrophic failure and it's just going to eat up your entire head and rocker box. So I ended up going, I wanted to prevent that, so I went with the Vulcan Works forged billet aluminum rocker supports. They come with the rocker lockers, which prevent any kinds of play, and it also comes with a brand new pair of rocker shafts. This entire system, this is like the dream team system. Uh, not killing it, ultra stiff, can take the harshest of cams, 
I'm not worried one bit. Throttle body, 62 millimeter HPI. We had some really good debates going on between what, and basically what size we should go with, ranging from the 58 mil all the way up to the 66 mil throttle hog. We ultimately decided on this because experts that know more than me said it will give you the right amount of balance between velocity and volume. If you prioritize one over the other, you're gonna lose power, you're gonna lose something. You need to balance it out. Velocity, they actually say, might actually be a little bit more important than volume, but you still need the volume. So 62 would be perfect. Anything bigger, you'd kill the velocity. Anything smaller, you'd kill the volume. HPI V2 air cleaner. Not my first choice in terms of looks. Can it suck air? Yeah. The throttle body is also, this is why I had to choose that air cleaner. The throttle body is a 62 millimeter and the back plate has to be set up to accept a 62. So the SNS would not have been able to do that unless I did all kinds of custom machine work, which I had so much on my plate at the time. I'm like, let's just go with the HPI and get it done. Maybe I'll come back to the teardrop. Maybe it'll grow on me. Yeah, tell your mama. Now by this time, the engine's pretty much all buttoned up, with the exception of a few different covers that I was dragging my feet on, just trying to get some new designs. Moving on to the drive train, first thing we come across is the compensator. The compensator is made by BDL, which basically utilizes giant threading. There's no springs or ramps, and this is typically what's used if you're not going with a straight sprocket and if the ramp system won't hold up. Now moving down the line to the clutch, there were a few different clutches that I was eyeballing. Uh, we ended up going over those, but it, they were either not available or they had a tremendous amount of lead time. So I ended up deciding to go with a clutch that I was much less familiar with, which was the BDL lockup clutch. All right, what do we got there, Andy? This is a high performance ball bearing lockup BDL clutch. The more and more I looked into it, the better it sounded because it uses these ball bearings. And the ball bearings are already in there? They should be right in here behind the pressure plate. I saw the way it works. They, they actually travel outwards yes. with centrifugal mm -hmm. energy yeah. as it, I yeah. guess, it, is it load or is it speed based? Speed. And the more centrifugal energy you give it, the more it puts pressure on the pressure plate. So it's kind of like a progressive clutch. I just want to show you how big the plates are. See? That's all surface area. Yeah, yeah. It was pretty much reassured that this thing was a serious piece of equipment. Very robust piece. Uh, very cool looking. We put that in. Uh, we had really high hopes for the clutch that it would handle that power without a problem. Next down the line was the pulley and belt, which needed to go. It was getting replaced with chain and sprocket. Hey, you remember, remember back when I did a wax clutch burned out and my belt? Yeah, we got that on camera. Fuck, that sucks. You know what a big job that is? Big cube. You're gonna need to beef up that drive board everything. Yeah, that's true. That's true, because I, I do do big cube and I'm gonna beat the hell out of this thing. So, I mean, yeah, belt will take it maybe for like a week, but the chain is necessary. kit from Zippers. They sell these kits, make it really easy for you. I got the steel sprockets. Right in there. Okay. So, 
looks like it's lined up. Everything. everything. Nice. Yeah, I sure wish it was like that when I was pushing it here. Pushing, pushing this, this motherfucker, motherfucker for a mile. mile. Like, imagine the bike is on a lift and you spin it and it doesn't even spin an inch. That's how much, it's as if you were on the rear brake. It wouldn't even go down a hill. So I had to like skateboard it down the hill. I finally did. Just to get it down the hill. I'm like, I can only imagine how difficult this is gonna be once I'm on flat ground. All right, Andy, what do we got there? Got a big, heavy duty racing O-ring chain. It happens to be gold. 530 EK chain in gold. What is, so what is that, got like wax all over it or something? It's uh, like a chain loop that doesn't fly off kind of deal. Gotcha. Uh, the sprockets ended up being, I did 23 in the front and 51 in the rear, basically identical to stock gearing. I made a conscious decision not to use a two into one because I wanted to keep it a Cholo build. The whole idea was to do a dual exhaust and get as much power as possible by tricks. Now in an engine design, particularly the twin cam and the whole twin cam drivetrain, there's, there's a decent amount of lost horsepower along the way. You know, and I thought, all right, well, instead of trying to max the horsepower out with a two into one, what if I were to preserve horsepower that would normally just be lost? And that would help bridge the gap between dual exhaust and two into one. First one is the spark plug wires were changed out to the Thunderbolt 50. It has the least amount of resistance among any spark plug wire on the market for a Harley Davidson. In an effort to squeeze every ounce of power on this thing, John insisted, was obsessive about indexing the spark plugs, which is a really old school drag race trick. Even I haven't indexed a set of spark plugs since the mid 80s. So spark plug indexing is basically a way of having control over the orientation of the open side of the spark plug. So in this case we want the spark plug open side to be facing the intake valve. That way when the rush of air and fuel come in it's going directly into the open side of the spark plug hitting that spark creating better flame propagation faster more intense. It's pretty simple actually. It's really just a washer, but it's a very special washer. For the rest of the parts that aid in preventing power loss, We'll start in the cam chest, the fueling race series components, which would be the cam plate and oil pump, both of which are allowing the engine to get oiled better and easier. So you have a better oiled engine, it's gonna run cooler, and if it's easier, then it's less strain on the actual power plant itself to pump that oil. The race fueling push rods, the stiffest adjustable push rods on the market and when you have intense spring pressures, which this is, the push rod, a, a weaker push rod, would have the tendency to bend or yield as, it, as it's getting pushed up. And that 
will cost you horsepower. Next up the line to the valves is the forged billet rocker support. The Vulcan works, we touched on that. It eliminates flexing. When you eliminate flexing, you get 100% of the power being driven. After that is the SNS forged roller rockers. And the idea behind that, not only are they extra strong, when the rocker comes down, it has a flat edge and it wants to touch the top of the valve stem. And when it touches, it's gonna wanna touch and then slide. In this case, it comes down and the roller rocker just rolls over it. it. It has a rolling action, so there's no sliding action. There's no side loading. The BDL compensator itself saves almost five pounds of rotating mass. Anytime you can get rid of rotating mass, do it. If you don't care about speed, don't do it, because you'll save a lot of money. Next is kind of a controversial subject as far as the amount of torque loss that you would have had um, that is getting rid of the belt in lieu of a chain. And it is said, I don't believe this, it is said that a belt will lose up to 12% of torque along the way. I don't think that's true. I think it's probably more like three or 4%. Um, but either way, we don't have to worry about that. A chain is proven to be less than 1%. Um, so either way, you're picking up torque. Uh, just It's a matter of how much. Now the crank balancing service, you know, Revolution Performance did the service. Not only was it done to make the crank even stronger than it already is, but it also balances this crank so that the engine runs smoother and a smoother engine is gonna produce more power than a rough running engine. Now I get it, a lot of these mods, they are basically not even measurable on a dyno due to heat soaking and dyno discrepancies and just run for run, you really can't notice. But as a collective sum, they will become measurable. Now, drivetrain's all finished. I got the engine covers back on, parts back from paint. So now I got the tank and the rear fender on, basically just the minimum amount to get this thing started and rideable. He takes Obsessive to a new level. He even came in and provided his own gas for the dyno, so he could be absolutely sure that there wasn't a trace of any 87 octane anywhere in that fuel line before that gas went in that gas can and then eventually in the gas tank of his bike on the dyno. The first start goes without a hitch. I wasn't there. I think I had to work that day. And no problem, they carted it right to the dyno for break-in and initial dyno tune. But now, you know, there's a deadline. I got two days to get this thing onto a trailer to head down to Daytona for the bike rally. This bike was supposed to go to Daytona. And we were on our way. We were on the dyno, we were getting stuff done. And then the starter happened. So day two on the dyno, I had the day off. Get a call first thing in the morning, and he's like, it's not starting. Andy called me up this morning. He said, look, starter, it's just not enough starter for this motor. It's just like, whoa, whoa, whoa. He's like, granted, it's 19 degrees, and it's in an unheated dyno, but still, um, yeah, I guess I figured 1.4 would have done the trick. He's like, I told you to go with that 1.8 kilowatt Terry component starter. I ignored his advice. I instead, I got the 1.4 all ball starter, wouldn't start. It had a brand new battery. It had um, electronic automatic compression releases that Andy had put in for this bike. Still just too much motor, too much compression, wouldn't start. He's like, I'm sorry, man, but this bike ain't going to Daytona. He's like, we're not gonna have it ready in time. He's like, you, you're gonna need a new starter. And he's like, I, either way, he's like, I can't, I can't dyno today. I cannot get this thing started unless we just put tons of heaters all over it. And by that time, we're just wasting time. You know, it sucked not being able to bring the bike down Daytona, but you know, it didn't suck that much because this is not the only built Cholo that I have. I gave you 
So bringing the soft tail cello lay frame down to Florida. Could be worse, all right? All built up 107 twin cam, things nasty. Now, I was down there mostly for business. I was hired by Metal Sport to make them a video of them down in Daytona. We went to a 34. That's why I hustle for that half a key, that's 12 G's. I'm trying to bubble every summer on LP. Pretty much considered the baddest audio bike in the country. And, and I can vouch for that. Yeah, it's crazy. It's crazy. And I'll put the link to the video that I made for them in the description. So if you guys want to check it out, definitely worth checking out. Now back from Daytona and it's all business in the dino room. Floor seats for the Knicks. Couple models blowing hits. They don't even want to pick. Want to lick up, want to yeah. yeah. I done made a couple hits. Going hammer with a pick. God handed me the gift. Not the slammer for a brick. Okay, I'm at Prestige and I'm at the tuning center. It's pretty sick. I hear the uh, fans running already. So I'm, um, uh, let's see if we can go surprise them. He's got his boots on. Oh man, yeah, it's chilly in here for real. There's the man. What's going on? It's going. It's going. Big sounds. Angry. The build is done. The bike's on the dyno. Short nigga by my dick tall. What a touch of bitch dog. Only thug nigga down at the bitch fall. Dyno tuning a performance package like that is no easy task. Tuners will tell you that it can take a week of dyno time to get it just right. We put 250 miles or so on that bike, on that dyno. Broke the motor in and tuned it simultaneously. Now, I wanted the power to come in at about 3,000 RPM because let's be honest, I couldn't care any less about low end torque. I don't care. I think it's an old man thing where you're just putting around and you know what? That's fine. You want to do that? Go ahead. What, what do I care? I'm, I'm, <laughs> I want to rip. So 3,000 RPM and up. Now, could I sacrifice a little bit at the top in order to get as much mid-range as possible? Okay, I, I, you know, you have to give up something to get something. There is no perfect cam, there's no perfect engine. And you can't just have all mid and top. You kind of have to pick one thing and maximize that extend it as much as you can. So of course, me being me, I wanted to maximize the mid-range. More and more power every day. The numbers were really good. The build has his vision, and his vision was a certain exhaust coming out a certain way, a certain sound. We got almost the numbers that we would have gotten had we put on a performance two in the one, which is the go-to for go fast. Clutch slippage. And he's like, all right, he's like, I'll adjust the clutch. Hopefully that'll take care of it. 
Okay, high hopes. And back in the dino room, now. Yeah, this BDL, I mean, it, it's a fancy I, I, clutch, but it, it just seems like a headache. So we decided to ax the whole BDL lockup clutch idea in lieu of the Evolution Industries Diamond Terminator clutch. Bring up the Terminator. Open this motherfucker up in a circle! He's a fucking monster! So I think everybody that has looked up clutches has eventually come across this Diamond Terminator clutch. Call up Evolution Industries. I'm like, what's the deal with this Diamond Terminator clutch? He's like, yeah, it'll handle pretty much anything you can throw at it. It's rated up to 220 horsepower, and that's a modest number. I'm like, all right. He's like, you got a choice between the medium springs and then the red springs, which are full power. So the clutch comes in, looks gorgeous. Run it down to prestige. A little crispy. Yeah, crispy. Crispy. So what exactly are you doing here? Um, I'm taking the uh, pressure plate off so I can access to the friction so we can soak them before we put them in as per the manufacturer's instructions. This is what we were running. It wasn't strong enough. So you've got more surface area. Quite a bit more surface area. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Another clutch in the book for Panhead. We're right back on the dyno. Full throttle pull and see if the clutch holds. He's like, it's gonna be a, a tough pull, which he wasn't freaking kidding about the tough pull. Yo, this is the same bike as last time? <laughs> And there's no feather in this clutch, which uh, <laughs> it's literally it's on or off. I first got on and went, man, oh, okay, <laughs> right, we're doing it, <laughs> right. So he, I definitely got used to it pretty quickly, but it's definitely on off. That, that's all it is. Right. It's it's a straight racing clutch. I've never felt a bike with such a hard clutch pull. It's got to be 20 times that of what a, a stock clutch pull feels like. Numbers look good, they're improving as we go, which is always a good sign. Multiple sessions to really get it dialed in. The ECU was kind of hanging us up because this is, this is an old twin cam ECU. Uh, the later twin cams, they had more advanced ECUs which could handle more precise tuning. A math formula, he's, he's doing some goodwill hunting shit right now. painstaking task. And I know because I was pretty much right alongside with him. Now you can make this bike have 160, 170 horsepower all day. What are you willing to give up? You want to give up streetability? You want to give up longevity? 
because if you're willing to give up the looks, all right, you're halfway there because you cannot make this bike, the way it looks, have 160, 170 horsepower. It's impossible because the true duels alone will always prevent that. Nice to see we finally broke the 140 barrier for mm -hmm. the torque. Yes, 140 and the fuel mixtures still isn't right. I could probably get that. It's over 140 for a minute there. Clutch feels good? Clutch feels good. Clutch feels good. I don't see any slippies. No. We don't like them slippies. No. 132 horsepower and 145 pounds of torque. I wanted to maximize the mid-range and the upper mid-range. So it would be three to like 5,200. That's where I'm looking at getting the most amount of power because I know this thing is still gonna rev out to 6,000 RPM and it'll probably still be climbing a little bit until it hits six, but I'm also relying on the long stroke to carry me around when I'm in the 2,000 RPM range. So that's fine too. This thing is a little soft on the bottom and I'm cool with that. 2,000 RPM, if you hit it, yeah, it's gonna be like, not a dog, but it's not gonna be fast at 2,000 RPM. It's really not even fast at 2,500 RPM. The power really comes in at three and it, it basically carries you to the end. But you could definitely see where the dynograph, it, where it starts to dip off around 4,500 and that's pretty much due to the exhaust. A two into one would help carry that all the way to the end, but a two into one would also sacrifice a little bit more of the bottom so the power wouldn't come in as quickly. So if you compare my 3,000 RPM launch to somebody with a two into one, I'm gonna beat you every time because at 3000 RPM, this thing has 83 horsepower and I've been studying dyno charts for the last year and it's very rare that I come across a bike that's making 83 horsepower at 3000 RPM. Everybody expects it to be slow. This lazy, fat, bagger, big wheel, heavy, it is anything but. So it surprises people all the time. Now, that wasn't my first thing, is to make it a sleeper. I just wanted to make it a performance cholo, as fast as it can possibly be in a class of its own, and that not only will it look cooler than your bike, but I'll beat your bike. So the day finally comes. It's like April 11th or 12th, and I'm finally taking the bike home with me. I gotta ride it like 20, 25 miles. No front fender, no headlights whatsoever, no tail lights whatsoever, no side covers, no bags. On top of that, a couple of my bolts loosened up that were holding my handlebars, so the bars ended up going like this. It was the sketchiest bike ride of my life, uh, but I finally get the bike home, thinking like, all right, I'll just put a few days of work, few, few days, days of work. work, I'll just put a few days of work into it and get this bike, and then that's it. I'm gonna kick it off for the season, bring it in public, and finally unveil this thing. Boy, was I wrong. Baby, we built this house on memory. So I had just had all the tins and fiberglass pieces painted. So some of those are easy just to throw on, but things like the nacelle, like that is a freaking pain in the ass. Gotta be a problem right from the start. And then on top of that, you know, that doesn't come with holes drilled. So you gotta drill holes in those four very specific spots, you know, into brand new paint. It's, it's nerve wracking. And on top of that, you gotta kind of disassemble the whole front end. That was like the least of my worries. Getting the tail lights all set up, which was a freaking nightmare with the wiring. Come on. 
you know, this fairly expensive Eastwood gloss black 600 degree paint, even on the heat shields, was melting it and softening it up and it started flaking and I mean that was, that was one run for about 15 minutes. That's what kind of heat we're talking about. So if you think you're going to put gloss black powder coat on your exhaust, you're dreaming because it, it ain't going to last. Typical powder coat lasts, I mean it can hold up to like, you know, 300s, you know, 350 it starts really getting soft, 400 it's like fully melted. Okay, so I just did what's called, what Andy calls, the shakedown ride. The shakedown ride. Basically just to see how many things you're actually not done with. Finally get rid of this fiberglass rat. More trouble than it's worth. A lot of oil spraying problems. It's coming out of the intake. It's coming out of the crank to oil tank breather line. Then it's coming out of my breather filter. These giant pistons, Big pistons huh? moving on this giant stroke, and every time those pistons go down into the case, it puts a high pressure system into the case. And that pressure just wants to go somewhere. It has to go somewhere, and it needs to find an out. The stock breathing system is just not enough. Uh, it, you just realize the week and a half, like, yeah, you did work, but um, you still got a long way to go. So I mitigated the oil problem by using HPI head breathers and an A1 Cycles oil reservoir cap, which has an NPT fitting so you can run a line out to a filter and now that becomes your case breather. Is it perfect? No. With this kind of displacement, this kind of stroke, some say it'll never be perfect. It'll never hold all the oil in. The best you can do is run the oil a little bit low and just kind of deal with it. Then I decided to change out all the fasteners yet again. So John, he has this thing with fasteners. ARP stainless bolts, six point. I'm now getting away from the 12 point because everybody's doing 12 point. I wanna go back to six point because I think it looks dope. had them basically titanium nitrided in gold. I'm gonna change every single bolt on the bike, and here we go. I stayed up for over 24 hours straight working on this shit. There are so many things that need to come off in order to get to these bolts. It's 3.30 in the morning. I'm just pulling the exhaust off now. 7.15 a.m. It is now 11.30 and I'm still working on it. That's a 13 and a half hour binge so far. Moon's MC Quick Throttle. Panhead was against this idea. He said the 131 is powerful enough where it's, it could be jumpy. On top of that, you got the HPI throttle body, which has a more aggressive cam built into it. So he's like, your, your throttle is gonna be more aggressive anyway, compared to stock. Now you wanna make it even further aggressive? I'm like, yup. Panhead said, don't do it. He's like, it's too much engine for such a quick throttle, but <laughs> I'm doing it anyway. He's like, okay, do whatever you want. Just, if you get killed, it's not on my watch. All right, now pick a mark. So pretty much like the E on the built well. Okay, so that's where it starts to go. And then, so I would say 
I'm gonna say that's just a hair over 90 degrees. Say, figure like 93 degrees from idle to full throttle. Now the lobe on the quick throttle, it actually doesn't take effect until kind of like in the middle of your throttle range. So when you're coming off idle, it doesn't jump on you. The only downside to this system is that I had to get rid of my brass grips, which I loved. They looked so good, they were comfortable. They were cold when it was cold weather, but that's the only bad part about the brass grips, aside from them weighing a lot. All the while I'm thinking, okay, I have a certain amount of power, that number doesn't change, but I want the bike to be as fast as it possibly can be. So then he starts talking about weight savings. So I need to make the bike as light as I can. I got five left in my So I read somewhere that somebody said shaving weight off a Road King is equivalent to throwing deck chairs off the Titanic. Well, I'm gonna show you right now, it is possible to make these Road Kings less than 700 pounds. Let's go. So we ended up going to the truck scale. All right, last time I was here, it's at 680. And I lightened it since then. I didn't, I didn't remove the shit out of the bags and I have more gas in it this time. All right, but check this out. Get a shot of that. 700 on the dot. With stretched bags, stretched fenders, a raked neck, 26 inch wheels, air suspension, apes, pipes that stick a foot out the back. He's got like the exact same bike as me. Bring it up here, let's see what it is. Yo, I bet you it's 700. All right, let's see. Maybe it's 680. Oh! What? 740. 740. Now anybody can just yank stuff off and lose weight but can you lose weight without affecting the way it looks? He put it on a diet. Anything that could be used a lighter material on was used a lighter material on. Titanium, aluminum, deleting things, lithium ion battery. One of the first things you can do to make your bike lighter is the battery. So now instead of a 22 pound die hard, I have a 3.2 pound anti-gravity lithium ion battery with 680 cold cracking amps. It's a monster. I shed even more weight by doing the rear sprocket in aluminum. Here's the steel. Five pounds, three ounces. It's the aluminum, two pounds exactly. Three pounds and three ounces less. I went actually down a couple teeth because I felt like the engine was screaming on the highway. So I just made the gearing a little bit taller. When I first came up with the idea and you know, initially put this fender on, I used these micro laser LED lights, which that was a great idea. I thought as far as saving weight and keeping the rear end looking clean, they just didn't work out. I'm assuming that these lights just are not meant for that amount of vibration. So they just, one by one, they just slowly started going down. I am now switching over to these three quarter inch lights. It's a pretty standard size, standard light. This is what you'll see on basically the, the side of like a tricked out tractor trailer. But now I need to drill four perfect holes. It's, it's very late at night. I don't feel like doing this. Um, the wiring harness, I did not label it because I thought I was only gonna have to do the laser lights once. once. And, and <sighs> this is bike building.
So I did finish the trio of Lindell brake rotors. I had the two up front and then I had that ghetto eBay one on the back, which I knew I was eventually gonna replace, but in lieu of weight saving, unsprung, rotating mass, I wanted to get the third one in the rear. They are lighter. I can't remember exactly, but it was many ounces less. That is a tremendous amount of titanium bolts on this bike. Anything that was metric was like a no-brainer. Anything that's, you know, SAE is expensive for, for titanium or even aluminum. And aluminum, you don't get the options for the head styles. It's basically just your hex, which is so beyond ugly. Uh, I do have plenty of aluminum fasteners, but they're all hidden because they're just so ugly. Basically just a lot of titanium for all the brake components because the brake components are in metric and metric is a hell of a lot easier to find in titanium. Now all the brake rotors have titanium bolts on them in gold, of course. The mounts that hold the calipers, these are massive bolts, 10 millimeter by in some cases 80 millimeters. And if you can cut that weight down by about half, which would be titanium, just in your brake caliper mount bolts, you're saving probably close to a pound. You know, you have a grade eight bolt, but it doesn't hold any load. It's like, all right, well, we can use aluminum for that. If there's no load on it and no excessive vibration, go with aluminum. If there's some load and vibration or either or, or even quite a bit of load, you can go with titanium. I'll admit it. I went straight off the reservation with the lightning of the bike. I did every, I even did the two bolts that hold in your battery terminals. I think I saved like a gram and a half per. Every time I see Panhead now, he always gives the bike a quick once over because, you know, he has a personal attachment to it. And because this was such a tremendous build. So he happens to notice my front engine mount is on its way out. He's like, yeah, it's, it, the rubber's already split and it's starting to crumble and you're gonna need a new one. So I said, uh, just stock? He's like, no, no, no. He's like, just get an alloy art good and tight and be done with it. And it lasts a hell of a lot longer. It's made out of poly, not rubber. And poly can hold up to the road grit a hell of a lot better. It can also hold up weight better. It can hold up power better. It's also aluminum, so you save weight. I saved three or four ounces just on that alone. He's like, get that, and basically you're almost good forever. I even drilled holes in my battery tray, shaved off a pound. That was probably the worst one I did. Fenders, nacelle, console, all these lightweight space age plastics. I needed to make my shifting faster. I had my shifter so far up that I would need to like wrench on it. So I lowered my shifter, that way I barely had to touch it. And then I made a few other changes. That's when I really started to lighten the bike. Um, some other ergonomic changes, because that's what it came down to, is ergonomics were preventing me from accelerating as fast as this bike can accelerate. Yo, know, talk about it. What, how fast is it? Out of control, dude. I'm, like, I'm trying not to hit the gas and it's fucking pulling twice as hard as my bike. I'm trying to go slow. Just eek a little bit and it's fucking out. So one of the first things I realized once I put this bike on the actual streets in live situations, I realized the bars are just too tall. Originally had 19s, that was crazy. 18s, also crazy, but manageable. At an 88 cubic inch motor, sure. Like, yeah, it's doable. But now with this motor, I knew it was just a matter of time until this thing got away from me and I was gonna end up dumping it or killing myself. So I'm thinking 16s are gonna become a reality. So I talked to my friends over at Cyclesmith Inc. They whipped me up a set of 16 inch premium bars. Unbelievable. You know, with Cyclesmith gear, you can always count on the fit and finish being 100%. 
installation is always undramatic and it, it was no different this time. Now, I put them on. I, I basically just did a mock-up. I was in the garage and I just kind of put them on the risers just to see how 16 inches would feel. Oh God, much better. <laughs> now, you guys know I like to kind of roll gangster, so the whole like pulled back bar look, like, no, that ain't my thing. Uh, it's either gotta be a 90 or pushed forward. First of all, Road Kings look, and this is this is subjective, this is my opinion, but I think that Road Kings truly look great with straight bars. Now, the straight bar look looks especially good when it's at a 90 degree from the ground. Incredible. Full control and I still look like the baddest mofo that ever lived. Let's just get the fuck out of here. So it's time to bring this bike on its first trip. Right, we were supposed to go to Laconia, it was a 100th anniversary, I wanted to go so badly. The, the forecast was literally all rain. We made a hard decision, we're like, it, we're just gonna be miserable, we're not gonna ride anywhere. So we decided, let's go somewhere else. So we went to the Adirondacks to go visit my brother, Sam and I went up. Sam and I made it up to the Adirondacks. We are now chilling at Rob's. Rob's got a sick ass garage. Um, uh, what can I say? We're just chilling, we're doing bike stuff. Rob needed an oil change, so, you know, God forbid he gets his hands dirty. So uh, I'm doing his oil change. And we're just talking about the work that Sam's gonna be doing his bike. Cleaning up the front end. My fucking tools. Yo, it's looking sick already. I think he said he's going full stunt with this thing. Made the same trip again a few weeks later. Uh, although instead of Sam, now my buddy Mike was up there. He was spending a couple weeks up there with his family.
you guys raced yesterday, do you feel like there's ever a chance at any gear, any speed in certain gears that the 103 could or would keep up? Nope. All right, let's go. Let's race. Hey. So every year. Don't get me wrong. I, I think I'll get him on a launch all day long. <clears throat> okay. And probably into, because of his torque. Probably into second. Yeah. But then it's just. We did this weird test with it. We should start this bike, put it in first, sit there, and just pop the clutch out and see what happens. <laughs> uh, instant backwards. <laughs> <laughs> right. I think it'll do it. Yeah. Let's. Yeah. So here we go. Installed. That's torque. That is torque. Yeah. Burned out at idle. All right, we're gonna run the same test on a 2012 Fat Bob with basically stock everything. Well, stage one, bro. Dyno tuned. All right, stock everything. <laughs> yep. <laughs> that was felt. That felt awful. That sounded awful. Also did this weird compression test back in Elmsford down a slight hill, dump it in second to see if the compression would resist or would it actually start. Uh, also didn't, nothing happened. It's just, there's too much compression. I'm always on the search for something new. Something exciting, something better, something just different. I'm thinking exhaust. I love the dual look. And I'm thinking, I'm a couple months in after the build, been riding it a while, and I'm thinking as much as I love the Chico pipes, I'm just curious what Steady Custom Cycles is working on. They're always up to new shit. They're my favorite muffler company. And when I mean muffler, I mean straight pipe. So they're like, well, we got these Hornet exhausts. You know, it's, it's pretty new. It's mostly perfected for the soft tail, uh, but we do make them for the Road King as well, if you're into that. So I took a look. They were a little long for my style, and the way the style is, they really couldn't shorten them. They're like, but we could do this. We could do like a megaphone at the end. So I'm thinking like, all right, I'm down with that. So they're like, do you want the tips in gold? I'm like, mm, yes, please. So they sent these new design exhaust tips out to be gold plated, actual gold plate. And this one cat in Texas does it. Unbelievable. Now Steady Custom Cycles, they know how to make loud shit. All right, they ain't fucking around. It's so loud. When it comes to loud, they know how to do it. If you don't know, I do some of the camera and drone work for John, filming, listening to this disgusting bike. I think I'm slowly going deaf from the noise because it's so loud. for probably six minutes of his drive, leaving my house down mm -hmm. Route 9, I could hear him. So he's now four and a half miles away. You want loud, they will deliver. These great tone, I can't say that they're too different from the Chicla pipes, but they are different. I, I gotta say, if there's one thing that's kind of noticeable, if I'm really splitting hairs here, is that these have like a, a smoother tone. It's just as loud, if not louder, but it's got this smoothness to it. The 
pipes are deafening, there's no doubt about that. They don't have the rasp that fishtails have, and that's for good reason. It's, a, it's a fishtail kind of sound. These have more of like a bark and a low end, and also a high end too when you're on a load. They kind of have it all. John thought it'd be a funny idea to race and uh, see who's faster. He's not gonna win. It's making about 430 to the wheels for horsepower. It's about 440 torque. So the race with Wiggy went pretty well. Now, when he leaves it in drive, even with the transmission tuning, which basically makes that regular automatic transmission shift nearly as quickly as a dual clutch transmission, it takes that car so long to hunt for the proper gear. By the time that car even finds the gear, I'm out. The race is over. So we switched to paddle mode. That way he could start the race in the gear that he was gonna race in and that's when things changed. However, we only did one race and it, it was kind of messed up. This bike is so loud combined with the wind noise that I didn't hear the third beep. I thought it was the second beep. So he hit it first, then I hit it, and I immediately kept up. But like I said, because that car shifts so quickly, every time I shifted, he started to creep away. So I have this impulse night, all right? I'm scrolling through Instagram, looking at all of the bullshit that these assholes that are just cranking out M8 143s, M8 131s, just uh, 160 horsepower, 170 horsepower. So I ordered the RB Racing LSR Pro Stock Pipe. The holy grail of two into ones. In your face. Oh my God. All right, time out, time out. I know there's a lot of Cholo diehards that follow this channel. Don't freak out. This is just an experiment. I wanna see what the power levels are with duels versus a two and a one. So at least I'm giving it the benefit of the doubt by giving the best two and a one I, I know of. Um, also, coincidentally, it happens to be one of the best sounding two and a ones and the loudest. So, let's continue. The install was very clean. You know, the nice part about a two and a one is that there's just not much to it. I'm used to duels, which have crossovers and pipes that stick 18 inches out the back. It's a little bit more involved. Bike fires right up and I am immediately blown out of the water by how loud it is and how nasty it sounds.
All right, so I never thought I'd be back in this room so soon. Theoretically, we're going to get more horsepower with this exhaust. The fear is that we might lose some torque. That's, that's you know, there's, you know, everything is give and take, nothing's free. I remember you and me, we were like, we don't know what's going to happen. It, no. could be, it could be totally wild off the charts, yeah. or it's just going to be like, eh. Yeah. I remember we were tuning it, you're tuning it, and we come up with 149. Yeah. And we had, we had a celebration right there. I was like, yes, we did it! Hello! You've been doing this for a long time. I mean, long decades. Time. Yeah, pretty much. Okay, yeah. and the twin. <laughs> All right, quiet right, on the on set. The set. <laughs> you said you never came across a twin cam that made this kind of power. Not, no, not. Uh, this is the most powerful twin cam that I've ever built, that I've ever have any knowledge of. Yeah. You know, and uh, it, I think when we we put it on the dyno after you put the exhaust on, I said I was hoping to see. 150, 150. What do you think, number? I'm hoping 150, 150. All right. That's what I'm hoping okay. for. The bottom line is, is I do Harley stage four 131s all the time. I'm going to say I did six of them this summer, you know, and a few of them had cam changes because the cam that comes with the, the stage four 131 Harley Davidson M8 is not optimal. Very mild. Right. And you're putting up better numbers than a 131 stage four out of the box. And better numbers than most modified 131 stage fours. That's it. These are the most impressive twin cam numbers that I've ever had on my dyno. One forty nine point oh four horsepower and one hundred fifty nine point twenty five pound feet of torque. That's a lot of power. That's like sideways on demand at thirty five hundred RPM and up. All right, so we got Johnny D here, and he's got a 2019 CBR 600, and I wanted to see how this thing would fare against it. All yeah. right, so D, tell me about the races. So What's yeah, it? so the first one, the first one, my, my, uh, I didn't start off too, too good. I was around 7,000 RPMs. Right. You took off on me, which you know was not too bad. The second one wasn't bad. I was, I think I was around around like nine, 10,000 RPMs. 
Um, that one was actually really good. We kept almost up to pace. Obviously, it was a little bit of a short distance, so we both kind of I know. didn't get to do much. There's a lot of traffic, cops and bumps, and yeah. Yeah, and then the, uh, the last one, I was at first gear. You know, we were doing about 20 miles an hour, I think. Yeah. It slipped out of gear, popped it into second. That was actually the first time I actually got a death wobble. All right, so final personal thoughts on the bike. It is so much fun to ride. The acceleration is awesome. Burnouts whenever you want, as loud as you want. You know, I haven't compromised on the looks, so it, it's still gangster. It still gets crazy amounts of looks and everybody wants to build something like this. Uh, on top of that, it handles exceptionally well for what it is. All right, let's not get crazy. For a 26 inch wheel with a rake neck, I, I'm so surprised how well it handles. It just, it handles a lot better than my soft tail. So I owe you guys a little bit of an explanation. The last film that I made, I asked you guys to comment on whether or not you thought it would be a good idea if I made a movie about bikes. Overwhelmingly, people commented saying, yes, make it, do it, it's a great idea. Um, and at the time, I thought it was a great idea. And what's even more impressive to me is that people commented, which means that you watched the film to the end, which to me means even more. We put our heads together. We realized how much time it would actually take to make a movie. And we just, we, we just can't do it. It's, it's, there's a reason why there's hundreds of people working on a set in Hollywood. It's because there's just so much work to be done and we had a crew of about five that were in, you know, interested in making this, not including actors, these are like crew members. I wanna give a special, special thanks to the people that helped make this happen. Camera crew did everything voluntary. There was no money. No money. JET Film signing off. We're gonna do the rollers. Rollers where? What up? I'm JR. I'm coming with uh, John, JET Films. Sacrificing my back for these sick rollers. No turn signals. Probably double the speed limit, of course. There's a cop sitting at the county center on 119, just watching the whole thing. I'm like, I'm getting arrested, but nope. All good. What up, guys? Fisky FPV. Yeah, we're Night. in the graveyard. What are your thoughts? You creeped out? Uh, they volunteered their time for probably the better part of three months to help me film this and dealt, dealt with me yelling at them and why can't you get this shot right and, and uh, do it the way I told you to do it. And still running yet again. Say, you know, he's got us out here, you know, every week, sometimes twice a week, late nights, but we're here. All right, so here we are. It's a Wednesday night, work night. It's 85 degrees, but we're all sweating our asses off. For you guys, hope you appreciate it. It's got to be, it's got to be like damn near 85. Yeah, it's hot and late. Come to Hayes in Lamont. Meet me at Hayes in Lamont. John keeps dragging me out every week. Yo, come down to Elmsford, come do a burnout, come do this, come do that. So today, I'm gonna race a CBR 600. And yelled at me multiple times about how he wanted his gas cap taken on and off. Yo, this thing is actually pretty fun. Yeah, it's so much fun. I was biting the inside of my cheek to keep <laughs> from laughing again. 
because I felt the fart coming. Oil pump and cam plate. <coughs> Fuck this. Alright, so what do you say? Should we move on from here? To where? 